So, I mean, much of what I'm going to tell you, you may already have heard perhaps more articulately this morning. So, we were asked to provide any, um, any conflicts of interest, so I'm currently co-chair of the Guidelines Committee, and as such, I'll be defending the College Guideline. <laughs> so, a wee bit of background that you, you all know, you all know. Group B strep is commonly carried in the gut and genitals of healthy people. If we look at different papers, different sources, we see that um, qu quite variable numbers. It's estimated in the UK the carrier rate is between 25 and 28 per cent. We know that GBS can be passed from pregnant women to their babies during labour. Again, numbers that um, we've heard more recent data today, approximately 0.36 to 0.41 babies per thousand live births contract some form of GBS illness. In the majority of cases, this is a mild illness. And we heard from Dr O'Sullivan earlier on that uh, I think the, the figure she showed was 0.52, I think. Um, and, and I think the slide was really quick, but I'm sure I noticed in Scotland it was 0.24 per thousand. It was really quick, but I'm sure I noticed that. <laughs> Whilst the majority of illnesses in neonates is, is mild, unfortunately, some babies may become more seriously unwell with GBS causing things like meningitis, pneumonia and septicemia. And approximately 25 babies a year in the UK sustain serious disability, things like cerebral palsy, deafness, blindness and learning difficulties. And we heard this in, uh, from earlier speakers this morning. Tragically, as you know, 40 babies in the UK each year, approximately 40 babies don't survive GBS infection. Um, as, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm, I'm not employed by the College or the National Screening Committee. I'm a full-time clinician in a district general hospital in the west of Scotland. And um, stories like, like this one here from the Metro I find incredibly sad and upsetting. Um, it's upsetting for everyone involved, it's upsetting for the women, and it's also upsetting for the people who look after these women. Strategies to reduce early onset disease in the neonate. Um, yep, this was, this was a paper from 2013. It doesn't mention vaccination. It doesn't mention giving all pregnant women antibiotics when they give birth. It mentions antenatal screening for maternal colonisation, usually between 35 and 37 weeks gestation. And we mentioned, we heard earlier that, that that strategy has been employed pretty widely worldwide. Identifying risk factors for early onset GBS in pregnancy or during labour and women identified to have risk factors are then given intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. Or this, this strategy here called a combination strategy where a culture is taken at 35 to 37 weeks of gestation and women with both GBS colonisation and one or more of the established risk factors for early onset GBS receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. Straight to the point, the RCOG Green Top Guideline, initially published in 2003 and revised in 2012, concluded that routine bacteriological screening of all pregnant women for antenatal GBS carriage is not recommended. So we grade our recommendations, and this is given as a grade D recommendation, and the evidence for that is given underneath, and it's evidence level four. And you see, what is that recommendation based on? Essentially, that is based upon expert opinion. It's not based on good studies. It's not based on good science. It's based on a group of experts coming to that conclusion. And in this particular case, the group of experts were from the National Screening Committee. In the supporting text here, we say, until it is clear that antenatal screening for GPS carriage does more good than harm and that the benefits are cost effective, I don't like cost effective, we try now to avoid cost effectiveness being mentioned in our guidelines, but it said it here, the National Screening Committee does not recommend routine screening in the UK. Initiating national swab-based screening for antenatal GBS carriage would have a substantial impact on the provision of antenatal care within the UK. Major organisational changes and new funding would be required to ensure an equitable and quality assured service. Those are the words used in the more recent version of the guideline. <coughs> we do recommend the administration of intrapartum antibiotics based on the following risk factors. So group B strep bacteriuria in the current pregnancy, group B strep, de strep detected on a vaginal swab in the current pregnancy 
Whereas Professor Steer said perhaps the woman complains of discharge or some thrush and we take a swab and the report shows group B strep. Suspected chorioamnionitis, broad spectrum intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended with GBS cover. Hyperexia in labour over 38 degrees Celsius, we do not mention epidurals. Um, and once again, broad spectrum antibiotics with GPS cover is recommended on a previous baby with neonatal GBS disease. And each of these risk factors has been eloquently critically appraised by Professor Steer. The RCOG advises against the following. It advises against routine screening of all pregnant women for antenatal GBS carriage. We advise against testing for GBS all the administration of intrapartum antibiotics to women in whom GBS was detected in a previous pregnancy. I am a clinician working in a district general hospital in the west of Scotland. It's not uncommon for pregnant women to say to me, will I be given antibiotics again since she found the GBS last time? I find it very difficult and I find it very awkward. I try to explain to them that um, the college guidelines advise against this practice. Um, we have a discussion and the management is based on an individualised... Um, let's move on. Antenatal <laughs> treatment. Uh, the college advises against antenatal treatment with benzyl penicillin if group B strep is detected and advises against group B strep specific antibiotic prophylaxis in these situations. Undergoing planned caesarean section with intact membranes pre-labour rupture of membranes unless there is known GBS colonisation, established preterm pre labour unless there is known GBS colonisation, and preterm pre-labour rupture of membranes. And when we look through the various um, guidelines from NICE, um, it's my understanding, I, I, I must confess I find it difficult navigating some of the lengthy NICE guidelines, but I believe there's a discrepancy between our guidance and the guidance from NICE, and it's never good to have inconsistencies in national guidelines. That's never good. So, what has been the impact of risk-based guidance? No benefit has been shown from studies in the UK, from the Netherlands, whilst benefit has been shown from Denmark and New Zealand. In England and Wales, a study published in 2013 showed rates of early onset neonatal disease fluctuated, but showed a general rise, and we've heard this from other speakers earlier on, between 2000 and 2010, from 0.28 to 0.41 per thousand live births. That's very, very difficult to understand. It's difficult to understand because we know that even if we're not doing this well, we are giving antibiotics to some women. Are we giving it to the completely the wrong women? Do the antibiotics not work? Or are the background rates going up, as, as was suggested from previous speakers? In the Netherlands, the introduction of preventive guidelines for invasive GBS in 1999 did not reduce the incidence of disease in infants. And the authors of that paper in 2014, Becker et al, concluded that it was time to introduce a screening programme. This is an old paper. Uh, 2004 from Denmark, and this shows um, it shows an, an, an initially a, a very high level of GBS. It was one. It was up to two cases per thousand live births back in 1993, and then following the introduction of a risk-based guide, guidelines, the instance of early onset GBS decreased significantly in Denmark. They concluded probably because of measures in pregnancy and during birth. So some some benefits there down to a low level of about. 0.15, 0.2 per thousand, but that's old data. More recently, 2015 study from New Zealand. So an introduction of a risk-based strategy as a single national policy to reduce early onset GBS occurred in 2004 in New Zealand. The first cohort, there's two, two separate cohorts here, the first cohort, 1998-1999, the incidence of early onset group B strep was 0.5 per 1,000 live births. Following the introduction of the risk-based strategy in 2004, the second cohort, 2009-2011, to showed the incidence of early onset group B strep to have fallen to 0.23 per 1,000 live births. The authors conclude 10 years 
after a similar survey and five years after promoting a single risk-based prevention protocol nationally, the incidence of early onset Group B strep disease in New Zealand has more than halved. So why have the RCOG guidelines failed to improve outcomes? This was a paper published in the BGOG earlier this year from Northern Ireland, where the incidence, I understand the incidence of um, early onset disease is pretty high. And in this paper, um, yeah, I think it's a wee bit flawed looking at the numbers, but the incidence was pretty high here. The incidence of early onset disease in Northern Ireland was 0.57 per thousand live births. 24 neonates who developed early onset Group B strep had one or more identifiable risk factor, but only 11 of these 24 cases received antibiotics. So 24 had risk factors, 24 should have received antibiotics, but only 11 received the antibiotics. And the authors say that at best guideline adherence was 50 to 70 per cent. To me, at best, guideline adherence was less than 50 per cent. I don't know where they got the 70 from, with respect to them. New Zealand, we mentioned this already. We said that the first cohort um, was 0.5 per thousand, and the second cohort had reduced to 0.23. But even in this second cohort, there were 16 cases where a maternal risk factor for early onset Group B strep was present, but only five of these 16 received antibiotics. And the authors said that opportunities remain to reduce the rate further. So whilst they did a pretty good job, they could do better. They said, until more effective strategies become available, it seems appropriate to consolidate and improve the current approach through ongoing education regarding risk factors and appropriate antibiotics for intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis and repeat audits. We must keep repeating the audits to monitor our practice. So they're saying they did a good job, they could do better, and they're concluding that they should stick with the current strategy, but improve on what they're doing. Alan's already mentioned these, these audits. So the RCG has conducted a number of audits looking at Group B strep over the years. One back in January 2007, the more recent one from March this year, and, and the second part of the more recent one will be published hopefully in the next month or two. The first audit, what was the, 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 the aims? The three aims were to carry out an international comparison and evaluation of existing national guidelines on the prevention of early onset Group B strep disease. Secondly, to assess the consistency of the local clinical protocols provided by NHS and independent sector obstetric units in the UK. And thirdly, to evaluate practice on preventing neonatal group B strep disease against the RCOG guidance and to assess whether it has changed since the surveys were carried out in 1999 and 2001. A number of, a number of recommendations um, that have been um, lifted entirely from that document. Essentially what it's saying here is that obstetric units should continue to offer intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis to women with risk factors in accordance with our guidelines that a local protocol or guideline should be readily available to staff and units should ensure that it's interpreted and implemented consistently. Units should ensure that their protocols are up to date and consistent with national guidelines, albeit adapted for the local context. Some advice for us, when revising the Green Top guideline, care should be taken to ensure that recommendations are unambiguous and comprehensive. There continues to be confusion about our recommendations. The revised RCOG Green Top guidelines should, guidelines should include clearly defined audit criteria, something that we do now for all of our guidelines. And it mentioned that there was an, a, an urgency to have appropriately undertaken research to fill the current gaps in the evidence base on which strategies to identify women for IAP are most effective in preventing disease. So we need research. We've, we've, we've heard about the, the risk factors that we recommend, that are recommended in our guideline, and perhaps some of the evidence um, advocating those risk, risk factors has been updated since the guideline was more recently published, and we need to take that into account. The second audit that Alan mentioned was to investigate the implementation of the revised version of the Green Top guideline, the 2012 version, in obstetric units in the UK to examine variation in preventive care for early onset Group B strep in the UK 
and to identify areas for improving guideline adherence and practice. The same sort of themes. Alan has gone through these recommendations very briefly. The report recommended that local guidelines on the prevention of early onset Group B strep should reflect the national guidelines and be fit for purpose. And like many of you are probably thinking, but they will say that. The RCOG will tell you to use the RCOG guidelines. Information on Group B strep provided to patients should be reviewed regularly and reflect national recommendations. We don't want any inconsistencies. It leads to confusion. Reviews of practice on preventing early onset Group B strep should be regularly undertaken. And inconsistencies in practice and knowledge should be challenged. For, for, for a while, for a couple of years, infection became the, the big thing in our units, infection as in hospital-acquired infections. And, and we, we, we created, I'm sure we have done over the whole of the UK, but in Scotland, we created infection champions. You cannot walk onto, well, first of all, you shouldn't walk onto a ward without using the alcohol gel. But if you're really busy and forget, because you've just used it 10 seconds ago, any other member of staff, regardless of pay scale, and I don't mean that kind of, but anyone could come up to you and say, excuse me, please go and wash your hands before you come into this ward. And so they should be able to do that. Similarly here, we need to heighten the awareness of the Group B strep recommendations and the Group B strep guideline because it's not a priority at the moment. Our college, in its press release for the, um, the more recent audit, said, this report highlights the need to improve the consistency of preventive care for early onset Group B strep in UK maternity units as it has identified marked variations in some areas of practice. The Group B strep support and um, the organisers of today, um, in response to the 3.7 per cent of units who have reported universal screening of all pregnant women, said, instead of calling for stricter adherence to the guidelines, which was the moral of the RCOG audit story, is it not more appropriate for the guidelines to catch up with the practice of screening that is already in play for these progressive units? You know, I would suggest they are not progressive. Personally, I would say they are not progressive. I'm going to stop for, I'm going to stop for one, one small minute and I'm going to tell you a small story. It's not a very good story. So, Mrs. Smith goes to see her obstetrician. The obstetrician says, hello, Mrs. Smith. I've got the results of your blood tests. You're anemic. Our guidelines recommend you take some iron tablets, one tablet, three times a day, and we'll recheck your blood again in four weeks. OK, doctor. Sounds good. One tablet, three times a day. I'll make sure I do that. There's no way I'm going to take iron tablets. I had them in my last pregnancy, and they made me really constipated. Four weeks later, hello again, Mrs. Smith. Unfortunately, your repeat blood tests have shown no improvement in your blood count. Oh, that's disappointing, doctor. Why do you think there's been no improvement? Oh, quite clearly the iron tablets aren't being absorbed from your bowel. We'll need to admit you to the ward and give you the iron into your vein through a drip. OK, doctor, sounds good. You maybe need to think about changing that useless guideline that recommended iron tablets. What a rude woman. But maybe she's right. Maybe the guideline does need to be changed. <laughs> What's the moral of the story? Never trust pregnant women to take their tablets. <laughs> no, that's not the moral of the story. The moral of the story, if a guideline isn't implemented properly and fully, then don't be surprised if there's no improvement in clinical outcomes. If a guideline isn't being implemented properly and fully, then consider what needs to be done to achieve this. Guideline implement implementation is a key element of clinical governance. In Scotland, we've got Healthcare Improvement Scotland. If we decided to change from risk-based to screening, we would be visited by Healthcare Improvement Scotland, who would audit our practice, tell us where we're going wrong, and tell us to correct that, not to change the practice. A lot has been said about Group B strep screening. A lot has been written, and I am getting the impression, as chair of the guideline committee, and therefore kind of responsible for the guideline, but I'm concerned that two camps have evolved. 
The case for screening and the case against screening and continue with the current risk-based approach. And it seems to, and this is not disrespectful, honestly, it seems to be the same people who are writing the same things in a very argumentative way all the time. Probably one of the most intellectual and insightful and persuasive articles I have ever read on the subject was this one from the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology of February 2015. If you read nothing else or take nothing else away from me, please look this out and read it. For both sides of the argument, it's fantastic. It's really, really good. I found myself agreeing with this side and I found myself agreeing with this side. And that's what we should be doing. We should be thinking, how do we move forward here? This side, incidentally, is Professor Steer. I am, of course, going to quote from the other side, because that's why I'm here today, from Peter Brocklehurst. What he says, most of, our, most of our efforts are directed at auditing and monitoring the offer and uptake of screening programmes, using clinical governance processes to ensure adherence to the programme with rigorous quality control. And I think of like first trimester screening, I think of quality control, I think of the amount of work and effort that goes into that. We don't put any of that work and any of that effort into the way we manage, the way, the way we try to prevent Group B strep. What he's saying, should we not have the same when we have a policy of not offering screening? Should we not invest some time and money at looking at the current policy to, to try and implement it so that it does make a difference? Should trusts audit their own practice to ensure adherence to national policy? And what role does the Care Quality Commission have in ensuring that trusts do this? So in Scotland, we don't have the Care Quality Commission. We've got Healthcare Improvement Scotland for our health boards. But they do have a role. They would not let us implement screening. Adherence to national policy, whether that is to screen or not to screen, is important when making sure that scarce resources are used most effectively. I'm going to finish, and to finish, I'm going to say that the UK strategy to reduce the early onset Group B strep is based upon the identification of risk factors in pregnancy or during labour. Alan mentioned that the National Screening Committee are currently reviewing the evidence. They say they will do this 2015-16. The process to revise the relevant RCOG Green Top guideline is now underway and it appears on the agenda for our next meeting in two or three weeks' time. It takes us three years three years to revise a guideline, which is too long. We now have a mechanism in place where we can produce, update or revise a guideline in one year. And if the evidence was compelling that we needed to change the practice, then we could revise a guideline in one year or less. Failure to implement guidelines is a clinical governance issue and deserves greater attention. And in this college, our guideline committee has been tasked with developing tools to improve guideline implementation. Thank you.